So my name is Jennifer, and I'm actually one of the pastors here on staff. Um, I usually teach to children, so this is a treat that I get to talk to grown-ups. Um, the pastor, uh, Palmer, and a bunch of other people, like Paul said earlier, are up at man camp and doing manly things. And so those of us that are left behind get to be here today. And uh, Palmer wanted me to finish out our short sermon series that we've been talking about, which is what we're here for. And we've been kind of going through our three core values here at the Grove, which are love God, grow together, and serve the world. And so Palmer and I are talking about it. He said, you know, I kind of want you to teach another aspect of grow together. And it's interesting because God's been really pushing something on my heart about that. And I thought, great, I have an idea. So one of the thoughts that I had was, what is the church here for? And, you know, before we even answer that question, I started even wrestling with this a little bit. What do people and how do people view the church anyway? And what, how do you define church? And so I kind of did like an informal poll with my family and my friends. And I said, hey, so what's the first word that pops into your head when you think of the word church? And so I kind of want to do that with you guys right now. I won't get data from you. We'll get a different data a different way. But I want you to think about the first word that pops into your head when you think of the word church. Maybe there's subsequent words that follow. So I thought, you know, for me to get some data, I hope that there was an online survey, and there was. And so I found this online results, and basically it was 2,000 people were interviewed, a church demographic and an unchurched demographic, but they didn't ask that until the questionnaire was written out. So they, do you go to church regularly, yes or no? And so what they did with the data is they actually divided the data up based on a church response and an unchurched response. And you know how when you have data from a survey, you can either do a bar graph or a line graph or even a pie graph, which have been kind of cool. But what they chose to do was what we like to call a wordle. And it's a word puzzle. And how a word puzzle works is that the bigger the word is on the wordle, the more commonly that was the answer. But all the answers are going to be on the wordle. So I've got an unchurched slide that we're going to show first. This is people's view of the church, when they think of the church. Obviously, there's a lot of different answers. But obviously, surface, you see community, God, religion, worship, prayer, Sunday, people, music, faith, Jesus. I mean, that's pretty good for an unchurched community. But then if you see kind of in the middle of our screen, they're boring, right? <laughs> you see, it's a pretty big word, too. Uh, you see religion. You see building. You see cult, glass. I guess they're thinking stained glass. Uh, you see judgmental. You see hypocritical. There's hate in there. There's bigotry in there. Dogmatic. Institution. I mean, when you look at those words and you look at some of the smaller words, even though those are not the most common words, those are still answers, right? And so that's something that we really have to look at and go, wow, ouch. And then I thought, well, let's look at what the church community and maybe what words they came up with. And so I've got this slide to show you in a word. And it's less words, but, you know, obviously we have a little bit more of that descriptive words of community. And so on the surface, it looks, looks rather similar, right? God, prayer, worship, love. Those are the more bigger common words. And maybe those are the words that you had in your head. Maybe, based on our past experiences and how we were raised or maybe an experience you had in a church, your word was on the other one. And I think that's what we kind of have to look at, because even if you look at this wordle in a com church community, there are some words behind these words that are smaller that I think are important for me to point out that you may be able to see is fellowship, friendship, community, inclusion. And so I really looked at that and thought, you know, if Jesus were to look at these two descriptions or listen to what was in our heads of what the church would be, would he look at that and go, it's not what I had in mind when I established my church. It's not what I had in mind. And so now that we really kind of look at how the world kind of views the church, and maybe those, those words are in our head, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor today. I want you to wipe your head clean. Take, back, take out past experiences. Take out negativity. If it's a positive influence, that's fine, but still I want you to wipe it clean. Because I think we need to kind of go back to what Jesus had in mind when he said the word church. And you know, the first time Jesus uses this word church is in Matthew 16, 13 through 18. So if you have a Bible, you can open up to there. If not, we have a slide for you to read along. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do you people say the son of man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. 
But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Jesus uses the word church for the first time, or did he? He didn't use the word church. Actually, he spoke in Hebrew, which was first translated into Greek, and you know what the word he used? Ekklesia. And maybe that's the first time you've heard that word, and it's got two spellings. That could be two Ks or two Cs. And ecclesia has a definition. You know how Jesus liked to use common words of that time and give it a whole new meaning, right? He used figurative language, and he used things that were happening at that time, and he gave it a whole new meaning when he was talking about his church. Remember, he used vine and branches. You know, he used all those different illustrations. And so when we look at ecclesia, he says, understanding the definition of ecclesia is an important component of understanding the church. Ecclesia is a Greek word defined as a called out assembly or congregation. Ecclesia is commonly translated as church in the New Testament. But do you guys notice all those words that come when people think of the word church? Community, stained glass, a building. Now we look at this and we see that ecclesia means a called out assembly. It was actually a word that was used within the government, the political part of the Roman Empire there, but it really means a called out assembly. What is Jesus saying in this verse, if we look back on this? It's a called out assembly by God. By God. He's saying, if you believe that I am the son of the living God, like you said, Peter, upon that belief, that rock, that belief, I'm going to build my ecclesia, my called out people. I'm going to build on that. And so does that give you a whole new meaning about the word church? And if you read through the New Testament, it's written about 112 times the word church. Ecclesia was 115 times, but three, it didn't mean the government side of things. And 112, it meant what Jesus meant. And so it kind of gives you a whole new meaning of what Jesus was talking about, a called out assembly. Think about that. We, if we believe that Jesus is the son of God and we accept him, we are called out that really does kind of give us a whole new idea because even if you look back on this scripture, let's put this in perspective. Jesus said, and this rock I will build my church, my ecclesia, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. You know, Hades is hell. Obviously, Jesus was not talking about a building or a place, was he? How is hell going to overcome a building? Hell can overcome a people that don't believe in Jesus Christ. And that's what Jesus was talking about when he was talking about his church. Now that we kind of understand what the word ecclesia is, I guess we can go back to what our question is. What is the church, the ecclesia, here for? And Paul does a good job in Ephesians kind of establishing what the new ecclesia looks like. And if you have time, it's a quick read. Go home and read through the whole book of Ephesians. It's amazing to sit here and see. It's the body of Christ. Jesus is at the head. What does that look like for us today? And we model a lot of that, what we do here today, based on what Paul wrote in his letter to Ephesus. And our key verse that we're going to settle in on today is found in Ephesians, and it's chapter 4, verse 11 through 12. I do have it up here, but you can follow along in your Bible. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. So let's just sit on this for a minute and let's chew on it. Because I think you need to see here that Christ himself gave apostles, we know who the apostles were, prophets, the evangelists, they're modern day evangelists today, pastors and teachers. To do what? Now, this is not a passive relationship, is it? Let's look at this, because it's, we're, those people are equipping his people for works of service to the, so that the body of Christ may be built up. It's a synergistic relationship. Do you see this? We have all been called out to do something for the church, all of us. It's not up to just the apostles. It's not just up to the pastors. It's not just up to the teachers. We all have, if we've been called out, that is a, that's a verb. We've been called to do something. And here, Paul touches on, there's several verses that talk about this, but we're, we're focusing on this, to equip you, us, all of us, for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. 
So when we think about the grow together aspect of the church, we're all supposed to be a part of that. And so now I think we can honestly answer this question that we had, what is the church here for, with my key idea for today. And my key idea is this. Our divine calling as the church, the ecclesia, the body of Christ, is to love, equip, and build up each other so that we can serve God with our gifts and share the message of Christ. And so I think when we look at our key idea, we think, okay, so now I kind of get it. So how do we pattern our lives now that we maybe are starting to understand that we're the ecclesia? What does that look like in our daily lives? Well, it starts with what you did today. You get plugged in. You plug into a Saturday service that we just recently started, or you plug into a Sunday service. You come here, and you hear things, and you learn things. You're getting equipped. And an early church in Acts talks about this. In Acts 2.42, I do have a slide for you, but you can want to write it down. We see that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. We don't have apostles anymore, but we do have disciples and we do have teachers and we do have, you know, pastors. And so we can say they devote themselves to pastors' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And so if you look at that, we do that, right? We model that pretty well here on Saturdays and Sundays as a called out assembly of God. And so one other element that, you know, obviously we did today, which was singing. And if you think about what Paul was saying in that Ephesians verse, did you notice that it was not a passive relationship? It's active on both parties, right? And so when we had our worship team come up here, we, they didn't just perform for us. We were actively participating in that worship with them. And you're actively participating in the service today. And so we actually see that 1 Peter 4 through 10 talks about another aspect that we do here at the church, and that's serving. Again, Paul touched on that. Why are we equipping the ecclesia? Well, it's to build up the body of Christ. So if you look at 1 Peter 4, 10 through 11, it says, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as who speaks with the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. It's interesting. Remember that wordle we had up there with a church community? Remember some of the words that I kind of intentionally pulled out that you really couldn't see? Fellowship, community, fun, inclusion. Well, this serving aspect is part of what Paul is talking about. We're equipped to serve each other, to build each other up. And so one of those areas we do that is serving on Saturdays and Sundays. And you know, it's not just the same 100 people that need to do it. It's all of us that have been called out. And there's so many different areas that we can do that. And I, of course, have an example in children's ministry because that's what I am, a children's pastor. And I have a husband and wife by the name of James and Tracy. And James has been serving in my ministry since pretty much I started here. And he was teaching at a first grade boys table. And he had a little boy by the name of Xavier at his table. And if you can envision this little six-year-old, he had little brown glasses, super cute kid. And he was being fostered by a family here at our church. And James and I were talking one day, and he's like, first grade's tough. You know, they're not really getting a whole lot. And I'm like, you know what? You're just there to plant seeds, James. You're just there to plant seeds. You just got to trust God's going to water that, and you know, it'll grow. Don't worry. And he's like, yeah, I don't know. Well, one day, Xavier had a moment. And he looks at him, and he goes, teacher, Mr. Teacher, guess what? I think I get it now. And James is like, what? He said, I think that God took me away from my dad because he really wasn't a bad dad. He just took me away from my dad because he didn't know how to take care of me. And he brought me my, to my new mom and my new dad so I could come here and learn about God and Jesus. And then I can go back and tell my dad all about him. God can use all of us to have that experience to speak life into our children, to speak life into each other. And you know the cool second part about that story is in that moment, James went home and to, with his wife and they prayed about it and they decided to open up their home to foster children. He found a new calling by taking time to serve and build up the body of Christ. That's what we do here on Sunday. 
And then, you know, we leave Sunday, and we're like, ooh, that was a great message, that was a great sermon, you know, it was a great, you know, music, I feel great. And then what happens? Monday comes, right? So I guess one of the things that we need to look at as the body of Christ is how do we stay charged up all week? How, what does that look like? And in Luke 9.23, Jesus is talking here. Then he said to them, and this is Jesus, so when Jesus says something, we should be listening, right? Whoever wants to be my disciple, my follower, basically, must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Let's not miss this. This is daily. Jesus isn't saying, pick up your cross and follow me on Sunday, and then go about your life Monday through Friday or Saturday. Jesus is saying, daily pick up your cross and follow me. So again, what does that look like as the body of Christ? Well, that means we do that in community. In Acts 2, 46, again, the early church modeled the church for us. And we read that every day, not on one day, every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Now, we can't meet here every day, okay? But what we do encourage everybody to be a part of is what we like to call life groups. This is a modern-day life group. This is what they were doing. They were going from people's homes. They were breaking bread. They were still worshiping together and spending time together and growing together in Scripture. If you're not part of a life group here at our church, I highly encourage you to get involved. It doesn't mean you have to have a perfect family. In fact, you can be single. You can be married. You can be divorced. It doesn't matter. Just get involved and get around people that have life groups. It is essential to staying charged up throughout the week. We also need to stay charged up in our home. Let me ask you guys in kind of an indirect question. How many of you guys have a relationship? Hopefully we all said, yeah, I have a relationship with somebody. Relationship with our spouses, relationships with our boyfriend or girlfriend. Maybe we have a relationship with our children, our grandparents, our dog. Whatever, you have a relationship. Now let me ask you this. To keep that relationship going... Do you have to spend time with that person? Do you have to communicate with that person? Because let me tell you, I counsel here at the church every once in a while, and I hear stories of relationships failing. Why? Because they stop communicating. They stop being relational. And that's the same thing with our Heavenly Father and our Savior, Jesus Christ. How do we expect to have a relationship if we're not spending time with him Monday through Friday? And I like to use the word charged up and plugged in because I think we can all relate to this, right? We have all cell phones. This is how we connect with the community, with our people, with our loved ones, right? Every chance we get, we want to keep a charge on this because if we lose a charge, what happens? You lose connection. Every time you're like, in fact, it's to the point now, and I'm guilty of it, I have a battery backup in my purse, right? I've got my car, has got a charger always plugged in. And sometimes when I go to my friend's house, I'm like, hey, do you have a charger? I don't, I'm, you have to lose my battery. Because we don't ever want the battery to die, because then what happens? You lose connection. It's a metaphor for pretty much our spiritual health as well. We can't expect to come on Sunday and get plugged in and then stay charged up for the whole entire week without getting charged up. And so these are areas in our lives that we can get charged up. And the number one thing is by reading God's word daily. I do not have a slide for this, but if you want to write this one down, it's 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. I'm going to repeat that first part. All scripture is breathed out by God. This is God breathing out and talking to us, called out assembly by God. This is his heart. One of the things when people come to me and say, I just don't feel this connection with God. Well, do you spend time in his word? How are we going to be connected if we're not spending time in God's word daily? Take, pick, up, pick up the cross daily and get to know him. Do you know it takes 30 days to create a new habit? Start today and for 30 days, carve out time in your day to spend in God's word and you will create a new habit. Another way to start, stay charged up throughout the week is by prayer. And to be honest with you, this is some, you know, a little bit of resistance in my home of, you know, okay, who wants to pray? I'm not going to pray. I'm not going to pray. 
You know, I'm always like, okay, fine, I'll pray. You know, there is a little resistance as believers sometimes that we don't want to even pray out loud. I'm afraid people are going to judge me by what I say or I don't know what to say. You know, Jesus modeled how to pray. And if you think about it, he said that in the, in the New Testament with the Lord's Prayer, right? And most of us grew up in a church where we said the Lord's Prayer. But really, that was an outline for Jesus praying. Because if you think about it, in the New Testament, did Jesus say the Lord's Prayer the entire New Testament? No. He spoke to God with his heart. And we, I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Let's think about this. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, right before he was arrested, he was so anguished, according to Scripture, that he was sweating blood. Okay, that's emotional turmoil. How many of us don't think that we can go before our Heavenly Father and cry out to him? Jesus cried out to God, and he said, God, if there's any other way, take this cup from me. He modeled how we talk to God. God wants to hear our hearts. He doesn't need perfection, eloquency. He wants to hear our hearts. The other way that Jesus modeled prayer, if you think about when he fed the 5,000, they had one loaf and one fish. Jesus took that loaf of bread and he asked God to bless provision. We can ask God for provision. Jesus modeled that as well. So the best way to be charged up as the ecclesia is to stay in God's word and in prayer. So what does this look like as a family? You know, it's interesting that... Um, Parents, we think it's like a responsibility. We take our kids to school. But, you know, there's responsibility that we have throughout the week. But actually, there's actually a commandment. And, you know, if God said, we should. And it's just because the commandments are, are the Old Testament doesn't mean it still matters. It still matters. Because, you know, if God spoke out this, then it's something we should listen to. And we read in Deuteronomy 6. Love the Lord God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. That's commandment number one. But listen to what God says through Moses. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. But next step, parents, impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hand and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on door frames of your houses and on your gates. Jesus is, co I mean, God's covering all bases, right? Let's look at this in 2016. Talk about them when you're in carpool. Talk about it when you're on the way to the dentist. Write a little love notes in the lunchbox and put a little scripture. Speak life into our children. You know Proverbs 22.6 says, Train up the way a child should go and he will not depart from it. Do you know that if we do not teach our children to follow Christ, the world will teach them not to. It is our commandment. It's a responsibility we have as parents to teach and train our children. Do you know kids are great imitators, right? I mean, how many of you guys think about when you maybe said a bad word when your child was like young, and what was the first word they said right after that? Or maybe you got a haircut, and then your little three-year-old comes out of the bathroom with her haircut because <laughs> she got a hold of a pair of scissors. I mean, children are great imitators. Do you know that that is by God's design? All of us have mirror neurons. And mere neurons mean basically that we can imitate what other people do. And actually, the cool thing about this, parents, is that it doesn't expire at age of 18. And God didn't say in Deuteronomy 6, up to age 18, impress these on your children, right? What did God say? Just impress them on your children. If you're sitting here thinking, I'm a dollar short and a day late on that one. You know, I didn't become a Christian until late in life. My kids are already out of the house. God has divinely made you still that parental role, even though if they're adult children, and you still can have that impression on your children's lives. Again, we have these mirror neurons. Those don't expire either at 18. As grown adults, we're still learning how to imitate other people. That's why when you go through a Starbucks drive through and it's pay it forward day, we just keep doing it, don't we? It's what we're designed to do. And so when I was thinking about some ways that I can encourage us as families to incorporate God's word and prayer into our lives with our kids, I thought about like the end of the day and dinner time, and it's a great time to unwind, and then I went, oh, wait, is that the, the most craziest time of the day? If we've got kids, to be honest, it's when practices are happening and when you're schlepping one kid to another place and maybe you're part of a carpool, and it's the last thing on your mind. In fact, I know I used to get that text message, what's for dinner? I don't know. 
I hadn't had time to think about it all day. I haven't even eaten lunch. I don't know what's for dinner. And so I started thinking about ways and creative ways to encourage you and give you guys some illustrations on how you can maybe help the kids along with some conversations at the dinner table. And, you know, dinner doesn't have to be a five-course meal. It could be payway. Dinner doesn't have to happen at our dinner table. It could happen in the car, before you head into practice. I mean, you just take time to spend time with the kids. And so I started thinking of some great unopened, I mean, open kind of questions you can ask your kids. You know, there's closed-ended questions, there's open-ended questions. And for the record, I know I've heard this from a lot of you. I ask my kids what they learn in church, and they go, I don't know. And I can guarantee you there is teaching going on down there every Sunday. They're learning something. So I know that a lot of times we have to encourage conversation, especially when they turn a certain age, like 13. And so you need to maybe have some fun, creative ideas. And Pinterest is full of them for those of us that are on Pinterest. So I thought, you know, let's look some things up. So I found this one idea was if you could invite anyone to dinner, living or dead, who would it be? And I thought, well, that's kind of a cool question because that gives you a little insight into maybe where, where your kids are at and maybe there's someone that you've never thought of they might emulate or like to talk to. And for my family, it would be a sports person, probably a baseball player, you know, is who they'd probably want to invite to dinner. And so in doing this, I stumbled upon something. And I want to show it to you. And it's a little bit of a food for thought. If you could have dinner with anyone living or dead, who would you choose? Carly Minogue. Oh. <laughs> Marilyn Monroe. Oh, God, I wouldn't have a clue. I oh, know, straight up. Yeah. Paul Hogan. Kim Kardashian. No, no, no. I'd like to have dinner with Justin Bieber. What? <laughs> He's not coming to my house. No, um... <laughs> I'd have Bob Hawke. Dave Hughes. Barry Humphreys. Jimi Hendrix. People who have made a difference in the world, maybe Nelson Mandela at the dinner table. I don't know what he's going to say. I'm scared. If you could have dinner with anyone in the world, oh. who would you choose? Probably our whole family, like a whole extended family. Mum and Dad. <sighs> Mum and Dad. Does it have to be a celebrity? Could it be family? We love it. We talk about how school is. We ask mum and dad how their day was. Family. Yeah, mum and dad. Family! Yeah. Who would you like to, like to have yeah. a dinner with? They just want to be with us mm. while they're eating food, which is pretty cool. They see us above everything. I'm gonna get... Yeah. Yeah. Bit, bit of a message in it for me. Yes. <laughs> I'm such a baby, I cry every time I see that. <laughs> I've seen it like a hundred times. Um, but you know what, I love that because it really does really kind of put things in perspective of what our kids value, right? Our kids value our time. And you know what, this just doesn't impact like grandparents, it doesn't impact parents, it will impact grandparents, aunts and uncles. We all have a role to play in building up our families and charging them up throughout the rest of the week. Now finally, I really want to move on to a couple more quick points. And I think this is really important for us to talk about. As a divine calling as the church, as the ecclesia, if we're called out, then we should be able to pass on our faith. And by what I mean about that is obviously we need to go out and we share the gospel out there. But we also need to share our faith with each other. Mark 16, 15 says, Then he said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole church and preach the gospel to the whole creation. Now, for fun, let's just take out a couple of these words just for a second. You've got the word gospel, which if you don't know what that means, that basically means the good news of Jesus Christ, okay? And you've got the word church in there, and we just learned when Jesus said church, what did Jesus say? Ecclesia. And so for fun, you might even just go home to your New Testament and cross out every church word and write ecclesia. But if we want to do that here, and let's reread it in, in what Jesus would have had said and said, go into all the world and preach the good news about Jesus to the whole ecclesia, the called out assembly, and preach the gospel, which is the good news, to the whole creation. Do you notice there's two things that Mark is saying that we should be doing? And if this is breathed out scripture, it says that we need to tell others in our own ecclesia about 
what God has done for us. It's called a testimony. And I know when I say that word, we close up really fast. Because we think, oh, shoot. There's shame in my testimony. I don't want anyone to know where I came from. I want anyone to think I'm really this good person, not who I was before I met Jesus. But that's the whole point. Maybe God delivered you from alcoholism. Do you know there's someone within our ecclesia that might need to hear that? Maybe someone's delivered you from abuse. There's someone in this church that needs to hear that. Maybe you don't have this grandiose story, but you've followed Jesus your whole life. That's okay because your testimony is always evolving. There's a moment when you fall on your knees and you call out to God to accept him. But there's also moments that he still, you still call out to God as you continue to grow in your faith. And those stories as God has delivered you through maybe financial distress or maybe he saved your marriage, those stories have to be shared within the body of Christ. Let me ask you parents, how many of you have ever shared your testimony with your kids? Do your kids even know that's why you come to church? That it's not just out of routine, it's because you're a follower of Christ and he delivered you from something? Grandparents, have you shared that with your kids or your grandkids? Carry out that legacy. It's what God wants us to do, is to continue sharing with our own family. Tell your testimony to your children. Again, remember, they're great imitators. And they're going to hear it. Some of us think, oh, you know what? I can't tell my story because it's got a little bit of a deeper background. Yes, you're the parent. Make it age appropriate. Okay, I get it. So one of the other things I want to remind you is that your testimony is your story. And the cool thing about testimonies is no one's ever going to tell you you're wrong because it's your story. The worst thing anyone would ever say to you is, good for you. Glad you found God. They're never going to tell you you're wrong. Another divine calling that we have as the body of Christ is to live out what we learn and know by using our gifts. Ephesians 2.10, I've got it up on this slide, says, For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Do you remember when Paul was talking in Ephesians 4 that we have this responsibility as the church to equip to build up so that we can all build each other up, okay? And in Ephesians, Paul says in here, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance. Basically, you got the call, you were called out by God, you accepted Jesus Christ, and guess what? He has a gift for, that you have to give to others. You have an assignment. It's like getting in the military, you don't know where you're going to be, but they're going to give you an assignment, and there you go, that's your assignment. And that's exactly what God has done for us. You know, here at the Grove, we have an amazing staff. There's about 25 of us. Do you know that we have 1,800 other talented and gifted, called out assemblies of God that attend the Grove? The church you all have a gift. You all have a purpose within this body of Christ. And so I want to encourage you today to live out your calling. And so what that looks like is when we started out our, our morning, we asked you a question. And I said, what is the church here for? So now I'm going to take out the word church. And I want you to do me a favor. I want you to Put in the blank on the bottom of your outline if you've been following along. If not, pull it out. What is Jennifer here for? Put your name. What is Eden here for? What is August here for? What is Tony here for? What is Kaylee here for? What is Brayden here for? What are you here for? Do you know that God has given you a divine calling? And so with that, now, I want you underneath that question to write maybe something that God's been tugging on your heart about. Maybe you can teach. We need teachers. Maybe you love kids and that story about James and Xavier touched your heart. We need you in children's ministries. But it doesn't just have to be here on Saturday and Sundays. Remember, Monday through Friday, we've got to stay charged up. We need people to visit people in hospitals. We can't do it all. We need people that are willing to be on our prayer team that will just be praying for people that are hurting. Maybe you're good at discipling. We need disciples. Maybe you're good at mentoring. 
We've got young adults, we've got high schoolers, they need good mentors. Maybe you're just really good at counseling and you've got this gift. We need counselors to help us. You have a tremendous opportunity to build up the ecclesia, the church, with a gift and a calling that you've been given. And so underneath there, write maybe something there, but I want you to take a second step. I want you to actually write it on a comment card. In your bulletins if you go, and if not, there'll be plenty out front. There's a comment card. And if you're a guest here today, thank you for coming. You can fill that out as well and drop it in our offering boxes as you leave. But fill this out and put on there an area that you want to be used by God here within the church body. Some of you might say, I'm scared to do that. Yeah, it is scary. Eight years ago, I was sitting in the same seats in that worship house over there before we built this. And I got a phone call from Pastor Palmer asking me to help run the small little children's ministry part-time, interimly. I'm still here. So yeah, that can be scary because you know if God's got you in, you might stay for a while. But it's even greater about this story, you guys, is that as I was sitting there, I'm thinking, yeah, that's great. Okay, I'll, I'll help do that. So I took that first step and I came to work that day. And then after that, if you were to ask me, honestly, if you were to ask me, would I ever consider standing up here in front of all of you and teach? No way. No way. But again, God had a bigger plan than I could ever imagine. It just takes you to take that first step to say, okay, I, I, I hear your calling, God. And then that second step to write your name down and then that third step, when you get the call, respond. Because I can tell you, when you're working for God, there's a synergy that happens that can never be explained. So finally, in closing, I'm going to ask, what if the building was not here anymore? What if the pastor left? What if the music stopped? And what if all of the ministries disappeared? Is the church still here? And I hope you can say with emphatic yes, because the church is you. The church is you with a divine calling. The church is you with a purpose. And the church is you on a mission. Mm -hmm.